Thanks so much, Halil, and thanks for having me here at this very important event today. And I just want to give an acknowledgement. My co-author, Joshua Kern, is in the back. Um, and our reports are available on the NGO Monitor website, so I encourage everyone to take a look at them if you'd like more details uh, for what I'm going to speak about today. I'm going to be talking about the COI and this charge of apartheid, um, and I'm going to use the Human Rights Watch report, which was released about a year ago, as the case study for that. But I just want to make two uh, preliminary remarks that built upon what uh, Colonel Kemp and Lieutenant Colonel Korn said at the last panel. And the first thing is that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Korn spoke of a disconnect that is going on with this effects-based analysis versus what the laws of armed conflict require. And the reason we are seeing this disconnect in these COI reports, and this is not the first time this has happened, this is a pattern that's been going on since the Goldstone Report in 2009, is precisely due to the lobbying of NGOs like Human Rights Watch. These are the organizations that are pushing this disconnect and trying to bifurcate the laws of armed conflict from um, international criminal law and from international human rights law. And in addition, um, they also spoke about the looking at the foundation of conclusions that are in these reports. And this is also a um, critical point that most of these commissions do not have the independent capability to conduct investigations, and therefore they rely almost entirely on reporting and claims from NGOs, and they do not verify those claims. They simply repeat them in their reports. It's simply a cut and paste job. And so again, that's what we're seeing here. And again, Human Rights Watch, as I'm going to get into, you can see their work all throughout this um, first report of Palais Commission of Inquiry. Now, the, the key purpose, or one of the key purposes of the Palais Commission is to set the stage to accuse Israel of apartheid. And again, as, as Hillel noted, the word does not appear in this report except for a brief reference to the, the um, convention. However, a lot of the language is, that's being used and the terminology is being drawn from these apartheid reports. And they're setting up the argument, they're echoing a lot of the arguments that are seen in these reports. And I'm going to get into a little bit of the background, which I think is very important, because I think that's going to clue us in as to when they are going to um, put these accusations clearly in their subsequent reports. And I also just want to highlight that on Thursday this week, the Committee on the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People in New York is hosting a conference on apartheid with Agnes Kalmar, who is the Executive Director of Amnesty International, as well as um, Prince Zaid, who is the former High Commissioner for Human Rights. So lest anyone think, oh, apartheid was not in this report, that is not on the agenda anymore, it is clear that that is on the UN agenda. They're just building up their case for it. So it's, it's very important to take note of all of these details that are happening um, on the sidelines. Now, the two background events have taken place, which is why Human Rights Watch issued its report when it did and why Human Rights Watch's report was influential. Number one, in 2019, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court filed with the pretrial chamber of the ICC a request to confirm jurisdiction to open a full investigation in the situation of Palestine, even though Israel is not a member of the ICC. And in February 2021, the pretrial chamber agreed in a controversial two to one decision to confirm that jurisdiction. So the prosecutor in March opened a full investigation. And in the Rome Statute, which is the governing treaty of the ICC, there is a crime against humanity of apartheid. Secondly, in April 2021, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination decided that it had, had jurisdiction to hear a 2018 complaint filed by the Palestinians accusing Israel of discrimination and apartheid. This was the first time this procedure has ever been used, and the Office of Legal Affairs of the UN did not agree that the CERD had jurisdiction. Nevertheless, the CERD decided to go ahead, and they actually convened their first hearings a few weeks ago. So Human Rights Watch's report needs to be seen in this context. The report was issued in April 2021, and time to take advantage of these developments. And when you look at the recommendations of HRW's report, you will see how it ended up influencing what happened. So when the conflict broke out, not as the report says with the incidents in Sheikh Jarrah, 
What they conveniently leave out of the report is actually why did the conflict start? In April 2021, in the lead up to Ramadan, there was an increasing incitement campaign by the PA and by Hamas um, targeting Jews and revolving around the Temple Mount. And there were a series of attacks on visibly Orthodox Jews um, by Palestinians that were, and these attacks were being filmed and posted on TikTok, which was leading to a spate of attacks. And then that led to a bunch of rioting on the Temple Mount. Then we had the Sheikh Jarrah protests, and then the rockets were fired on Jerusalem, the six rockets. Um, and that, that is why the conflict then grew in intensity. But they used this conflict, the council used this conflict then as a perfect pretext, and then coupled with HRW's report to instead investigate what they call the root causes of the conflict, including systemic discrimination. Now I'm gonna to read to you two recommendations that were in HRW's report. First, quote, support the establishment of a commission of inquiry by the UN to investigate all forms of systemic discrimination or repression based on group identity in Israel or the OPT. That's one recommendation. Second one, Quote, established through the UN, an international commission of inquiry to investigate systemic discrimination and repression based on group identity. The inquiry should be mandated to establish and analyze the facts and where applicable, identify those responsible for serious crimes, including apartheid and persecution, with a view to ensure that the perpetrators of violations are held accountable, as well as collect and preserve evidence related to abuses for future use by credible judicial institutions. The inquiry's mandate should be sufficiently broad to cover the role of other actors, including companies and officials of other states. And lo and behold, this mirrors the mandate to a T of the COI. We have, by their own admission, if you look at their FAQs on the website, they admit it's the most unprecedented broad-based inquiry that the Human Rights Council has ever had. Um, and they've set up this inquiry to collect evidence, um, that they hope to send to the ICC and that they hope will be preserved for use in domestic um, cases across the globe. So you can see how the recommendations in their report fit in perfectly to what uh, the Human Rights Council was doing. Now to turn to the report itself, and I have, some lim I have limited time, so I'm just gonna highlight a few aspects of it. Uh, the release of the report was accompanied by a massive PR campaign promoting the narrative that previously the apartheid charge had only been confined to a few radical actors, um, but things had gotten so bad that a threshold had been crossed, and now mainstream groups like Human Rights Watch could no longer remain silent. But in fact, the charge has a very long history rooted in Arab and Soviet propaganda, and again, that's in our, in our reports, and we're actually doing a lot more writing on this, and we're gonna be publishing subsequent reports during the next year. Um, Human Rights Watch report was actually basically a recycling of a report by Palestinian activists and UN rapporteur John Dugard in 2009. So they were basically recycling this 10-year-old report. And it's critical to note in the report, it is based on an invented law of apartheid that is aimed at decontextualizing apartheid from what occurred in South Africa from 1948 to 1994, give or take. And it's essentially what I call a Franken definition of apartheid. It mashes together the aspects of various legal instruments, notably the 1973 Apartheid Convention and the ICC Rome Statute. It fudges the concept of race to uh, accuse Israel and Jews of, of racial discrimination. And also the concept of race is integral to the definition of apartheid. And it also equates the concept of domination, which is another core element of the crime, with simply that of control. Rather than, again, stripping the notion of aggravated racial discrimination that is key to the crime of apartheid. Um, another pernicious aspect in the HRW report, and this is clearly echoed in Pillay's report, is that while it claims to only be accusing at this time, note at this time, of Israel practicing apartheid in the West Bank, Gaza, and, Jeru and East Jerusalem, a significant chunk of HRW's report focuses on supposed policies that are taking place in Israel. And again, we see this in Pillay's report. And there are many factual errors and distortions. Um, and really to do a, a comprehensive debunking of these claims would require hundreds if not thousands of pages. Again, you can go to our reports to see some of this debunking. Um, but also, Primarily, it's erasing the history of 
the conflict and taking out the security context. So it ignores that over time the government has taken measures. It also ignores over time that the government has taken measures to ameliorate policies and practices that could be discriminatory and the types of policies that are present in every country of this world. There is no country in this world that does not have discriminatory practices and policies and can do better. Um, but, but the, the core point of what HRW is doing is it's basing its legal claim of apartheid on the core foundational features of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, most prominently the law of return. So in other words, the entire report is aimed at attacking the legitimacy of the international legal foundations of the Jewish state. And you see this in its most extreme form in the Amnesty International report that came out in February and that was adopted by Michael Link in his March 2022 report to the council. So HRW's recommendations in the report are clearly in line with this goal. So they call for extensive BDS measures by the entire international community like apartheid South Africa. And what, what do we know about that campaign? That campaign was meant to eliminate the regime. And that's why they're adopting an apartheid South Africa campaign towards Israel, because that's the goal. They call on the PA to end security cooperation with Israel. And they also demand that Israel implement a so-called right of return, which again would eliminate Israel as a Jewish state. So the police, and, and I'll wrap up because I believe I'm out of time, but um, the police commission was clearly influenced by HRW. And I expect that as the commission continues its work, because as we know, it is a, a permanent commission and we will be having two reports from this commission every year now in perpetuity. <laughs> um, we're going to be seeing more and more of the language of HRW's report. We're already seeing such things such as the term fragmentation of the Palestinian people. We're seeing that in this report already. It's clear they're building up to it. Um, and I think we'll be seeing, and I, I think what they're doing probably is waiting for the CERD committee to make some kind of recommendation so that they claim they have some back ba basis for adding it to their reports. Um, and I think we'll also start seeing more and more of HRW's recommendations, BDS, right of return, uh, featured more and more prominently in the upcoming reports by Pillay. So I will end it there. Thanks. Thank you, Anne.